Hello and welcome to coverage of Grand Prix Denver. I'm Marshall Cycliffe in the booth with Reed Duke, and we are honored to bring you coverage of the finals. Matt Severa versus Steve Rubin. This is our first and second seed coming into the top eight. As far as matchups go, Reed, we've got Teamer Etherworks, much more of the mid-range deck out of the two, as Mardu Vehicles is going to be taking the aggressive stance here. Matt Severa has earned the right to play first in, uh, in all of the top eight matches that he played. This is, of course, his third one being in the finals. And uh, so that puts him on the play and a nice start for Matt. Yeah, when it comes to creatures, uh, this is a normal start that we've seen a lot from Matt over the past couple of rounds. No surprises. But take a look at his lands. Uh, for his Mardu deck, he actually Whoa. has two lands capable of producing blue mana. And that could be a sneak preview at what we're going to see in the post sideboarded games as Matt has come prepared for this matchup with Ceremonious Rejection in the sideboard. Of note here, by the way, Reed, uh, Matt is on six cards here. He did take a mulligan for our first game. We're going to be playing a best two out of three match, just like you would at your local game store. And is that a, a Thalia that we see here? Mm -hmm. Thalia, Thalia Heretic Cathar. Yeah. So Steve Rubin's going to be put to the test. He's... If you're a Steve Rubin fan, you're you're definitely hoping he has Harness Lightning in his hand here. Yeah, I think he but does. But even that is just the beginning because he's got to choose whether to cash it in on the Smuggler's Copter before that attacks or the Thalia. Yeah, he gets kind of double duty there because that also shrinks the Inventor's Apprentice back down to a 1-2. Mm -hmm. Note Noteworthy that Inventor's Apprentice and Toolcraft Exemplar are templated slightly differently. With Toolcraft Exemplar, you can go to combat and lock in your bonus until the end of the turn. But the Inventor's Apprentice is just a passive ability, and Steve was able to take that away from the Apprentice. Steve Rubin playing an Ether Hub as well as a Woodweaver's Puzzle Knot as he attempts to work his way up into what could be a turn for Etherworks Marvel. And if he has it, he could be setting up for a very early activation of that, and Matt Severa is not going to have many ways to interact. Yeah, though speaking of mana bases, Steve Rubin's also playing a, a multicolor deck. And what that means is that a lot of his lands are non-basic. And in the face of a Thalia, he uh, doesn't have a great chance of having a fourth land untapped here and the Aetherworks Marvel. Let's see what he's found. He also has multiple ways to search for lands in his list. He's got a tune with Aether that he can use to find a land. I believe he has another Ether Hub. Is that what you're seeing there, Reed? Yep, Ether Hub shuffled to the front of his hand here. So that is a, a land normally would enter the battlefield untapped, but in this case against Thalia, it's not going to be able to give him his fourth mana. Mm -hmm. So he might have to settle for either cracking the Woodweaver's Puzzle Knot or maybe casting Whirler Virtuoso off of his untapped Ether Hub. Still gets the energy out of the deal, putting him up to five, just one shy of Marvel range, and he has a Marvel in hand, doesn't he? Yep. Wow. So we could actually see next turn him playing and activating it, right? Yeah, we absolutely could, although things are not as good for Steve as that makes it sound because he's capable of taking a massive amount of damage this turn. All of his defense comes in the form of creatures, which are entering the battlefield tapped, unable to block. Um, so Matt Severa has free reign this turn. And next turn, even if Steve has a great turn with Marvel and uh, hitting, you know, say an Eldrazi or an Ishkanah, those creatures are going to come into play tapped too. Ugh. So the question is, can Matt Severa capitalize on this narrow window and finish the game before Steve can really come into his own? Well, here's eight damage that says yes from, <laughs> from Matt Severa, knocking Steve Rubin down to a lowly seven. Steve has the puzzle knot on hand as well. If he can find the time that could help him climb back out. The crazy part is, is that Steve's gained three from that as well. He would normally be all the way down to four life. Yeah, really, really impressive, aggressive draw from Matt Severa here. And I think the key card has been that Thalia. Uh, Steve Rubin had a tough decision of what creature to kill with his removal spell on Matt's turn three. He decided to leave the Thalia and, and she's really doing work here. Credit where credit's due. That's not a usual Whew. card. Oh, oh man. look at this. Unlicensed disintegration to knock Steve Rubin down to, to four. Now, what if Steve hits Ulamog? That is a cast trigger. Mm -hmm. Yep, that's a really important interaction to be aware of here. So if, if Steve hits Ulamog, he can target 
Thalia and whatever else you would like with the cast trigger and have that be gone in time for Ulamog to hit the battlefield untapped. It looks like Steve is off of that plan, though. He's made two Thopters. Mm -hmm. So perhaps Depleting he wants to energy. survive long enough to... Well, he has some options here. He could play the Marvel, and then if he chump blocks with both Thopters, that's two energy there. A few more when he untaps with Woodweaver's Puzzle Knot. But he really has to hope that Severa does not have another removal spell. Um, unlicensed disintegration would do it, no problem. Okay, well, a second Puzzle Knot's going to give him a bit more of a cushion here. Back up to seven life. Matt Severa, you, you mentioned it uh, earlier, is playing the, f the full four copies, right, of Unlicensed Disintegration? Yep, that's an unusual choice in the Marty Vehicles deck. A lot of times you see two or three to be a little more uh, conservative with the, with the Black Splash. And to finish my uh, a thought from earlier, Thalia Heretic Cathar is not a ubiquitous card in these Mardu Vehicles deck, and, and Matsavera has three. Whoa. And that might not be a coincidence in how well he's done this tournament. It's an excellent card against green-based mid-range decks playing Ishkana Graf Widow. Not sure what they're talking about. Maybe an energy situation? Yeah, it seems to me like Steve should have a lot more energy than he does because... He should have six, right? He was at one, played a Conduit, and played a Woodweaver's Puzzle Knot. Mm -hmm. it, um, but these are triggers that you can miss. What sometimes is tricky is if you cast your spell and you announce the trigger, but you don't officially move your dice, your die. Uh, and then that's a little bit of a gray area where sometimes a judge needs to intervene and decide exactly what had happened there. Is the scenario such that he is not getting that energy right now, though? I think they're pausing for a judge to, okay. to weigh in. Because that would be a real shame. I mean, that's the difference between being able to activate the Etherworks Marvel and not. That could easily be the game. Mm -hmm. the, the, you know, that's a huge, huge difference in this scenario, right? Yeah, um, it's it's huge. A few a, a few points of energy could, yeah, could could determine this game very easily. So we'll see what the judges say. I would guess that Steve, you know, knowing how things work in, in high-pressure tournaments, I don't think that Steve just missed it, and that's it, and he's trying to, to get a, a chance at a take back here. I would guess that there was some kind of confusion, you know, something verbalized that maybe yeah. make, makes it an unusual situation. You know what I think it might be, Reed, is I wonder if you play a puzzle knot, can you gain the life but not get the energy? Like, Good question. They may be linked together where if you recognize half of it, then the other half just happens as well. That's an excellent question. I'll see if I can look up the answer. Sometimes we have to play judge here in the booth, though. Worth noting, neither, no, neither Reed nor I are actual judges, so we leave that to the professionals that are here on site. But, uh, you know, we got a couple of minutes to chat, so we may as well speculate a little. Yeah, so what you're getting at, Marshall, it's not a legal thing that can happen in a game of Magic that you, that you execute half of a trigger. Mm -hmm. uh, you have to do the full ability. And it looks like, yes, Woodweaver's Puzzle Knot, when it enters the battlefield, you get three life and three energy. So you could miss it. You could just totally um, bungle it and you know, say, mm -hmm. say go and not get anything. But if you get the life, you should get the energy as well. Right. And we do see that Steve did, in fact, get the life he was at four. And now he's at seven, at least according to our thing. All right, so we have the table judge coming back. Oftentimes, we'll take this moment to check on a different match while we let the judge do their work and come to a conclusion. But as you, you may know, we're in the finals and uh, kind of stuck here, Reed. So we'll hang out, and we'll see if, uh, if Ruben ends up getting the energy. It looks like he does. Okay. And I also saw the judge put a card from Matt Severa's hand back on top of the library. I guess maybe that's just being thorough in order to fully rewind the game. It's not going to actually affect what's going on here. Yeah. Right. That is a, something you'll see the judge do. Okay, but Matt Severa knows exactly what he's doing here. He's jamming with team, and that's going to prompt both Thopters to block the Scrounger, and that's going to get Steve down to two life. Okay, so he can't win the game this turn. The best he can do is, is <coughs> play out another attacker. Wow. And um, this is a huge turn, right? Uh, Marvel, spin it. A huge turn. 
<coughs> Notably, Severa has Scrap Heap Scrounger in the graveyard, but no creature. Mm. So that could come up if something winds up dying this turn, but if not, he's not going to be able to return the Scrap Heap Scrounger. <coughs> so this game gets incredibly interesting if Ruben winds up hitting Emrakul here, because he's not winning on the board with an Emrakul because it'll enter the battlefield tapped, meaning yeah. he can't, the he best can't he attack can do the creatures it. Into, into a waiting blocker. Right, he, he can attack one. One of the apprentices can can run into a conduit, right? Yep. But that's it. That's that, it. That, that is not a devastating <laughs> Emrakul turn. And that makes it very easy for <coughs> Matt Severa to win the game the following turn. Um, as you mentioned, Steve would love to be able to hit Ulamog, but it looks like he doesn't want to chance that, and he's going to actually just ignore the Marvel temporarily and, and, and try, try to fight fair a different way. Yeah, I saw that he found another Servant of the Conduit to play. Ah, but he's left his mana available. Yeah, so just on the board, he could <laughs> block with Servant of the Conduit and use a Woodweaver's Puzzle Knot. That lets him survive the attack. Okay. There's also the chance that he maybe found another Harness Lightning. Yes, that could be the case as well. Yeah. Harness Lightning actually would not do it, though, because now that Severa has ah. produced an artifact, he has three lethal attackers. Harness Lightning only allows Steve Rubin to deal with two. So Steve has to now chump lock Thalia and then use the ability from Conduit to go awkwardly down to five energy, put himself to five life, take four, and go to one? And he's just losing his Conduit in this exchange as well. Yeah, it's not a great spot. Back up to eight energy, of course, from the Woodweaver's Puzzle Knot. But he's at one, and Severa's at 20. Go! And now, is there even Ulamog doesn't do it because... What about Ishkana? Ishkana ordinarily would, but because of the Thalia Heretic Cathar on <laughs> Severa's side nothing. of the battlefield, most of Steve Rubin's uh, defensive measures and his, his get-back-in-the-game type of cards are just not going to help him. He finally plays the Aetherworks Marvel, but does he even have hits here that matter? Let's find out. Ulamog alone is not going to do it. That only answers three. Emrakul... Doesn't do that much on the board, but maybe Severa can have something in his hand that allows Steve to... <laughs> he hit Emrakul, Reed. Yeah, we'll see. Is it good enough? It feels like it's not. Hell, he's going to play it. But yeah, like you said, I guess what he's hoping for is that Severa has removal spells in hand of some sort. Seems unlikely. Severa reminds Steve that the Emrakul is going to enter the battlefield tapped once again, thanks to Thalia, as you outlined earlier, Reed. And uh, that Thalia is an absolute all star. Also, Severa was top decking. He had no cards in hand. Mm -hmm. Does Matt play any cards that allow target player to gain some kind of large amount of life? It seems not. Steve Rubin's <laughs> picking up his permanence, and Matt Severa convincingly taking game one from Steve Rubin and setting himself up to be one game away from his first individual GP title. It felt to me like that game was all about Thalia. Me too. She was absolutely the MVP of that game. There are so few cards in standard that match up well for an aggressive deck against Ishkanah Graf Widow. Thalia is one of them. If you're able to get a good start, it, that's the type of card that just prevents your opponent from ever catching up with you. Um, the Mardu Vehicles deck has a lot of great, great, great options at the three-drop slot, including Depala Pilot Exemplar, Pia Nalar, um, removal spells, other, other vehicles like Cultivator's Caravan. But Severa has really gone far out of his way to include three copies of Thalia Heretic Cathar, and they're paying off for him this weekend. I mean, how crazy is that? R Steve Rubin had the ability to to activate an Aetherworks Marvel and hit an Emrakul, or just to play Ishkana with Delirium, and neither were even close to enough to Not save him. Not even close. Right. No. Like, Ishkana did stone nothing on that board, just dead to four different creatures. Everything's delayed a turn when you're, when you're talking about defending yourself in the face of Athalia, and 
that's not the way mad that's not the way competitive magic is you can't just take a turn off no. you can't be a turn behind your martyr yeah. vehicles opponent you're dead you're not only are you dead but you're dead by so far yeah. if, if you have to play the whole game that way yeah it's so funny i you know i have a friend that was learning how to play magic somewhat recently and he was telling me about a game that he had played, and he was like, I just needed one more turn. I can't believe how mm -hmm. close I was, and it's just, I just kind of <laughs> smiled to myself. Yeah, buddy, you and everybody else. Exactly. <laughs> like, join the club. I, the, the, the truth is that a, a turn is a really significant amount of game, mm -hmm. right? It, it is not just one more turn. You know, because magic compiles, compounds it, right? It's not just one thing that you get to do on a turn, right? You draw a card. That's something that can change the game completely. You get all of your mana available, which opens up a whole lot of opportunities. You get another attack step, which if you're trying to do like what Matt Severus can do, that can be the difference between eight damage and zero damage, an extra turn, right? It, you know, each of these things combine to make, you know, again, you know, for those of us that have played a long time, I'm sure everybody in the chat's going, yeah, I remember when I used to think a turn was so close to a victory. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but yeah, it, it, it turns out it's not at all. Yeah, especially in, in standard today, the cards are so punishing. It oh, so yeah. unload so much damage so quickly. Well, we should talk about the sideboard for these two players. Matt Severa came prepared for this matchup. In fact, he added an entire color of mana to his deck to be prepared for this moment, for this matchup. Four ceremony rejections in his sideboard to be cast off of Ether Hub, Cultivator's Caravan, and Spire Bluff Canal. This is his way of stopping Steve Rubin's most important card in Aetherworks Marvel. Also has other targets like Woodweaver's Puzzle Knot, um, the late game Eldrazi if the game gets to that point. But yeah, this is a card that Matt Severa really wants to lean on to, to be able to not lose to Steve's best draws. Steve, on the other hand, he doesn't really have any countermeasures to those ceremonious, ceremonious rejections. He's forced to just treat this as a normal, aggressive matchup. He's going to try to defend himself as best he can, uh, sit behind an Ishkana wall of spiders if he can get that far, and uh, just use whatever sources of late game card advantage he's able to put together. If he can have a perfect Aetherworks Marvel draw, yeah, he's certainly open to that, but he's got to fight through a uh, possible ceremonious rejection in order to do it. Now I have kind of a weird question, but Steve's deck is is too all in on Aetherworks Marvel to try to veer away from that plan and play like a fair, you know, delirium ish plan, right? Like he can't, because remember they get to look at each other's deck lists here in the top eight. So, you know, he looks and goes, "Wow, Matt is really well set up for the deck I'm trying to play." Is there any way he can just say, "All right, let's get the Ulamogs out of here, let's get the 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 Aetherworks Marvels out and try to play a more fair game." To some extent, yes. To some extent, no. Okay. I don't think it's reasonable for Steve to, to cut his Eldrazi's, his Marvels, and all of his energy cards. There's just not enough in his sideboard for that to be possible. Okay. He can move a little bit away from it and focus more on his anti-aggro creatures and removal spells and just have the Marvel as sort of a backup plan, not really um, gearing himself just to try to activate Marvel as quickly as possible, but just having it as a, a late-game card advantage engine. That is something that's going to be possible. All right. But um, the, the Mardu Vehicles deck is not just some stupid aggro deck. We've talked a lot and seen a lot over the course of this weekend. It's staying power and its ability to still fight deep into the game. Um, it doesn't flood very easily. It has Planeswalkers. It has Creature Lands. So a teamer control deck, it's not a foregone conclusion that just some, you know, a teamer control deck is going to outgun the vehicles deck in the late game. Right. Steve Rubin really is going to need something like the Marvel. Looks like we've got mulligans from both players here. Yeah, does this mean Severa's going all the way down to five? Could or maybe he just took his time thinking I, about that first hand? I, I, I think he's going to six, but we'll, we'll double check when he uh, peels him. Oh, Rashad says five. Okay. Yeah. That can't be good. No, certainly how, not. how bad is it? I mean, he can still put together a little one, two, three... You know, uh, I had a conversation with my teammates at dinner last night, and the topic was what kind of decks in, mul in Magic mulligan the best. There was some controversy. We talked about it, but a lot of us tended to think that a deck like Matt Severa's mulligans pretty well. You don't need a lot of lands to operate, and you really just care about having the best possible 
turns one, two, and three. And a card like Smuggler's Copter is so great at making sure that you can smooth those draws and not have a non-functional hand. So I, I certainly wouldn't count Matt Severa out of this game just because he's starting on five cards. Okay. All right, well, we're on our way in game number two. This could be the one that decides it. And there it is, turn one play, Toolcraft Exemplar for Severa. If he follows this up with an artifact of some sort, the damage starts flowing very quickly and really forces Ruben to react. It looks like he doesn't have it this time, though. He's going to chip in for one point of damage. Ruben's is going to take it. Goes down to 19. There's an ether hub for Severa, who just passes the turn back. I think I see a Harness Lightning in hand for Ruben, but he declines to use it on the lowly 1-1 as it sits, and you can see why. Yep, he has Whirler, a card. Virtuoso, also, he needed the red mana from his ether hub. Mm -hmm. He has a card that's adept at um, neutralizing a Toolcraft Exemplar. Severa has an artifact, but Ruben can still trade the actual Virtuoso itself with Toolcraft Exemplar if he would like. Um, and if Severa ever doesn't have an artifact in play, even a Thopter token is good enough. Matt decided not to offer that trade. Cultivator's Caravan is going to unlock his mana and maybe even give him a way to start attacking with a very formidable creature, one that's hard to kill with Harness Lightning. Yeah, so Steve Ruben did nothing on turn four. There's a really elegant thing about the construction of Matt Severa's deck, which is that uh, Ceremonious Rejection is a one-mana counter, and Cultivator's Caravan perfectly disguises having a one-mana blue spell in your hand. Mm -hmm. So it looks like Steve's going to do five damage to the Cultivator's Caravan. You know, I mentioned that it's a tough thing to kill with Harness Lightning. You can do it, but it used up quite a bit of his energy. He's down to one now. And he's going to go for a Vessel of Nascency. It looks like he's just going to crack it immediately. Do you always think that the person's looking for a land if they do that? Yeah, oftentimes. Mm -hmm. um, he could also be slightly disguising what's in his hand. Um, or he could be looking for something like a Servant of the Conduit or another Vessel. Anything that he can spend his mana on. Yeah. Well, it did disguise it nicely because his only choice were lands there. But he did end up putting uh, a Kozilek's Return into his graveyard. That might be relevant down the line. Yep. Matt Severa really has just had a poor draw this game. He yeah. has too many lands, and he didn't have either his veteran motorist or his smuggler's copter to smooth things out. Yeah, I'm, I'm waiting for Steve to really punish him for it. He hasn't thus far, but he could be getting close. Yeah, his vessel didn't even give him delirium. No, he's he only got three. Enchantment, land, and instant. So Ish Ishkanov's sitting in his hand. That's going to be a really good card in this game. But right now, if, if he were to cast it, it wouldn't have his full effect. The interesting question comes up when the alternative is doing absolutely nothing. You know? But there's no rush here, Marshall. Matt mm -hmm. is not mounting a big um, <laughs> offense. He hasn't really done much at all. Steve Rubin's at 19. Okay, I have well, a 3-5. All right. It's got reach. Also, sometimes you'll see players do this if they have multiples in their hand, mm -hmm. which he doesn't. But Ruben has correctly assessed that Matt Severa is flooding very hard here and has produced a grand total of a 1-1 one -one at this point in the game, and that if Ruben can pounce on him, once Severa gets far enough behind in the damage race, his deck does such a poor job of blocking that Steve can just keep hammering him here, and Matt really can't muster much of a race. And every turn that goes by that he doesn't add meaningful cards to the board, it gets worse and worse. He's down to 13. Yeah, man, is this game just going to be decided by a, a pearled unicorn and a, <laughs> an iron root tree folk? You know, I think vanilla, it might. Vanilla creatures. Matt's going to crack back here for three now that he's found a creature, but he has no blocks. And wow, even more lands for Severa. Seven lands out of this deck that wants, what, three? Mm -hmm. Maybe four if he's got Gideon. That, that is brutal. So it's cool to note that Steve had, had left his Evolving Wilds uncracked for a turn. Mm -hmm. um, that could be to combo with either Etherworks Marvel or Tireless Tracker if he had brought that in. Um, but he's deciding to crack it now because he must be thinking about uh, some combinations of cards, like maybe a Vessel into something that could be relevant. Also, uh, he only has one energy, but he could activate Ishkana's 
drain ability for an extra one point of damage you're, if you would like. You're totally right. Oh, no. I think he just drew a Kozilek's return off the top of his library there. Mm. That would leave this board looking real ugly for Severa. It also makes me silly for saying Pearled Unicorn a second ago, and really that Whirler Virtuoso is much better. Three toughness. That's right. <laughs> Punished in the booth. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Ruben looks to be in really good position here. He can attack for five. He's now going to change gears, it looks like. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Uh, he wants to put the onus on Matt Severa to make the first move. So, for example, you know, devote a removal spell to killing my Ishkana, then attack me, then I'll use this Kozilek's return. I see. Or play some more creatures, set up your board, get ready for a big attack, then I'll use Kozilek's return. There's no rush here. I'm the stronger late game deck, and I have this, uh, you know, pseudo trump card already waiting in my hand. Yeah, you know, I think that Severa is going to oblige him here because he's going to use an unlicensed disintegration to take out Ishkana right now. So the question is, does Steve respond? If he does, he won't take the three damage from unlicensed disintegration, but he won't get as much value. I think it's time. Yeah, I would, I would cast it. Um, you save yourself the three damage from the disintegration, and you don't have you neither have to trade off your creature nor take extra combat damage. Mm -hmm. There it is. So this really worked out perfectly for Steve. Yeah, that's a nice play. He's still going to lose Ishkana, but mm -hmm. that was going to happen no matter what. Um, so that makes a, f a fourth card type in the graveyard creature now. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. Severa just did this with the all in the stack. Mm -hmm. <laughs> good, so he is going to take the three. I like that from Severa. I, yeah, I did not anticipate up. that. It did actually end up using up all of Severa's energy. He doesn't have access to black mana that I can see. That might come up down the line, but he just used you know, two of his key abilities there. And Ruben's back on the race, oh. and we can see why. Here is Ishkana Graf Widow. That was off the top, actually. Yes, it was. And now he's got... Delirium, and I can't imagine Severa coming back after this incredible mana flood that he's experiencing here in game two on a mulligan to five, no less. Tough luck here for Matt. He's hung in there nicely, but it's just eight lands, mm -hmm. and that's going to do it. So Steve Rubin keeps things interesting, and he's going to give us a game three. Now, of course, this does mean that Matt Severa back on the play right where he wants to be. Yeah, you know what? If Matt Severa was going to have to have one bad draw, that's the game he wanted to have it in. He mulliganed to five. He was on the draw. Um, he really just wants to have the, the, the powerhouse hands when he's on the play and run Steve over and hopefully have a 2-1 a win with relatively easy games. That would be his first choice. So you see the players going to sideboarding again. Unclear if they're actually going to change things. Um, you, they could change change their strategy on the player of the draw, or they could just be reconsidering or making the opponent think they might be changing something. Yeah, it was kind of interesting. We uh, I don't think we saw a lot of sideboard cards that game, did we? It looked pretty straightforward from both sides. Yeah, we really uh, well. The Kozlex returns are actually sideboard cards for Steve Rubin. Right. And we saw and it served both an important those. role there. Yeah, for sure. Also see that Steve's got a couple of natural state he can bring in. That can deal with some pretty pesky threats over on Matt Severa's side of the board. Natural state's an excellent card against this Mardu Vehicles deck because not only is it so efficient, one mana instant to deal with um, any troublesome threat, but it also can tag the vehicles when they're not active, which makes it a lot more of a convenient removal spell than something like Harness Lightning. One thing I'm very curious about is, is whether Steve will bring in any of his blue counter spells. You could certainly make an argument for Ceremonious Rejection against a Mardu Vehicles deck like this. However, uh, blue is only Steve's splash color, so I don't know exactly how realistic it is to have blue mana ready for, for a turn two Smuggler's Copter. I guess that's something you learn from playing Team or Aetherworks as much as Steve Rubin has. You know, every time I say that about somebody, they tell me, oh, yeah, somebody handed me this deck on Friday night. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
You ever do that? Do you ever have, you ever change your mind mere hours before the tournament starts? Change my mind, yes. Uh, I'm not really one to be handed a deck the night before because I don't trust anybody except myself when it comes to magic. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense because if they forget, then you don't get to play in the tournament. Yeah, well, I mean specifically with a deck list. I always, oh. I like to do things my own way. That's that's I'm just stubborn wow. in that in that sense. The Reed Duke way, <laughs> or the highway. Yeah, you do have your own style. That's for sure. You play some spicy ones too, man. Sometimes. Yeah, I remember watching you play Legacy a few years back, and you had <laughs> some real decks there. All right, these players are just about ready to go. Top eight shaped up, kind of interesting of note. No green black. Yeah, the green black, I think it got creamed by all the Marvel decks. Dude, it totally did. It, it ended up being the third place in our uh, metagame breakdown for day two. 26 copies made it into, uh, into day two. But yeah, we have the, the, deck you, the decks you see here, and we also had Panharmonicon, a blue white flash, a red white aggro. Another blue-white flash, so a couple of those. A blue-red emerge, which was last round. And we also had a regular red-green marvel, the one without the... the so blue. if we were to really oversimplify things, you could say three blue-white decks, two marvel decks, two vehicle decks, and one other. Yeah. Though putting the Panharmonicon deck in with the other blue-white deck seems... Yeah, that <laughs> seems is... like a stretch. Mm -hmm. But that's true. Shoehorning it in there. Yeah. All right, here we go. Taking a look at opening sevens here for our final game of GP Denver. Will it be Steve Rubin with Teamer Etherworks? Will it be Matt Severa with Mardu Vehicles on the play? Gotta favor Matt here. Just has to, right? <laughs> this is what his deck's built for. Well, uh -oh. he's taking a mulligan off maybe the bat I, here. Maybe I spoke too soon, Reed. Another mulligan for Severa. And Steve Rubin looks like he's keeping or perhaps just taking a second to think. But his, his hand looks good to me. I see lands and spells. See that natural state pulled to the front. Yep, yeah, that card you mentioned a moment ago. Yeah, and I see some, some forests in there too. So I, I, would, I would anticipate him keeping this. I think that might even be a tireless tracker, which was another card I, I was curious whether or not he'd bring in. I'm not 100% sure I saw that correctly. We'll, we'll see in a few turns. Yeah, I've been wondering about that myself. Yeah, he's got an Ishkanah. He's got a bunch of forests in his hand, though. And a tune would do nicely. Mm -hmm. Still have not seen an Etherworks from him in post-board games yet. But I have to say, it's not the end of the world to not have it in your opener here, right? Like, he almost would prefer to be able to set up his creatures and then draw it a little bit later. All right, Vera's kept on six. Thank goodness. Yeah, if I'm Matt Severa, I'm happy to keep... Six six cards every game if I can have turn one toolcraft exemplar. Right, and there it is, right off the bat. Does he have the follow up? Ooh, right off the top oh. of the library. <laughs> I like that. That was a scry to the top, I believe. Ah, okay. All right. Well, either way, natural state is going to take care of it, and of course he's going to do that before combat starts. So he only takes one damage from the exemplar, and you can see a pair of vessel of nascencies. He says, "Do your worst, Matt," and that it's going to be three. Marshall, that natural state was huge. That was the only card in the format that could do that. For, for the amount of mana that he had. Yeah, killing, wow. killing the unactivated copter and shrinking down the toolcraft exemplar. I mean, Jeez, it, six cyborg tech from Ruben. Yeah, I mean, it, it's going to buy him so much time compared to if he had just the same hand minus the natural state. Yeah, and you know, the interesting thing is that you have multiple options in green. These, you know, we call them naturalized effects. There's multiples in the format. You know, you, you can play. I think there's at least three that you can play. And he's decided to go for the cheapest one that doesn't gain him any life, like Appetite for the Unnatural. Interesting spot for Severa here, whether or not to crack the clue. Uh, he has two mana, so he'd he love to crack the clue, but it's his only artifact for the purposes of Toolcraft Exemplar. Part of his decision is going to be based on, I, I think I saw that he had a Gideon ally of Zendikar in hand, so I'm not sure if he has... Whew. Untapped mana for it, but that's this is a, a nice great one play as well. Yeah, and keeping that clue on the battlefield is going to get him an extra two damage here after a, he uses an extra five. Excuse damage. me, five total. <laughs> right? Yeah, after he uses the unlicensed disintegration. Oh, and this is a this is a crucial turn where Steve is going to have to spend his time and mana smoothing his draw. 
does not have a land in that <coughs> pile either, if that's what he was looking for. Oh, wow. We'll find out in a moment. It looks like he's got at least another land drop to hit, so it won't be the end of the world for him, but these cards are slow. Vessel of Nascency is slow. Okay, he does have another land in hand, yes, thankfully. He's so got the, an island. The, the game's not going to be over on the spot, and he can pick up... Um, well, he already has an Ishkana in hand, but either way, that, that's good. He's all set for next turn. That's going to be his best play possible. But right now, he's just got to think a few steps ahead, and what is he going to need down the road? What is he going to need if I the Ishkana see. cannot stabilize him in the way he wants it to? Right. So he's going to be able to play a Servant of the Conduit this turn. He can go Land Servant, if that's what he wants to do. That gives him a blocker for the Thraben Inspector, or he could even trade it. And this does not look that bad for Steve at all, does it? No. Like I, like I said, I, I, I think Matt Severa has a Gideon in hand. If he can play that this turn, it's going to be huge for him. Is, uh, is Ruben three-quarters of the way to Delirium or all the way to Delirium? I see instant creature enchantment. Oh, you're absolutely right. Huh. Yeah. How does he not have Delirium? It felt like he would have it, didn't it? Yeah, and that um, makes his, his choice of whether to cast Servant of the Conduit or leave up the two mana for Vessel of Nascency makes it a very tough call because if, well, first of all, the Delirium thing is a huge issue, but also if the Servant somehow dies, either in combat or through a removal spell, he might not have the five mana necessary. Ooh, Ooh Matt Severus laid it on real thick now. He's going to play a Gideon, immediately make an emblem out of it, and attack again. That is a very gutsy play from Matt Severus. Super aggressive. And I think part of this play has to do with what you just mentioned, that Steve Rubin doesn't have Delirium. So Matt Severus knows that if he can close this game in a two-turn window... He doesn't have to worry about the best card against him in Ishkanah Graph Widow. If he slows down, plays a longer game with Gideon for value, he knows that Vessel's going to get cracked, and then Ishkanah has a great chance of coming down. So he is absolutely putting it to Steve Rubin here, attacking for six and dropping him to three. Steve keeps his Servant of the Conduit alive. Matt Severo is telling us that this game is going to be decided within two turns. That's right. What is Rubin going to do? Now, he does have the option of just casting Ishkana. We saw it last game. Right. And that actually does a pretty good job, at least with what we can see on board. I don't think he needs to do that. Harness Lightning can take care of the Toolcraft Exemplar, which yeah. is the biggest threat here. And he drew that for the turn, so that opens up a lot of options for him. But the precarious life total of three... Is it possible Matt Severa set this up because he has an unlicensed disintegration? Absolutely in possible. I was thinking that a minute ago myself, Reed, that Matt Severa could just say, I don't really care what you do as long as it's not a Woodweaver's puzzle knot, which it's not. He sees an Etherworks Marvel, but there's also a land in there, so he will get Delirium. Look at Matt Severa's posture right look now. Look at him. Does he look nervous? Oh. I'll say. I think he does. <laughs> oh, deep breath for Matt Severa. This is super close. Steve Rubin, of course, a pro tour champ. He's been under the hot lights. He's definitely felt the pressure. And Severa has too, to be honest. And he's even felt perhaps more pressure. You know, when you're playing with your teammates and it's all on you, they're sitting right over your shoulder. For sure. That's the real for deal. Sure. Rubin's going to take an Etherworks Marvel. <clears throat> now he has Delirium. Now he has Delirium. Go. His only red mana source is the uh, Conduit at this point, but good enough. What does Matt Severa have? Can he finish this off? This is his last clean window to do so. If not, Ishkana is going to make it very, very difficult for him to attack for the rest of this game. Maybe he's got another Gideon. <clears throat> Maybe. You know, he made the emblem last turn. Maybe he was like, okay, I'll follow up. If this doesn't work, I'll have a, a Gideon to lean on to generate me some advantage. Yeah. 
So Steve actually wants to rewind a little bit here and say, how about before you go to combat, I might have something I want to do. This is after his main phase and the beginning of combat step. So it hasn't been declared yet. No so attackers. Steve wants to kill the Toolcraft Exemplar and go down to one life from the <laughs> Inspector. He, I think this is important to him because he, he, his only source of colored mana right now is the Servant of the Conduit. Yes. That's correct. He's at one. And it's a Thalia. Oh my gosh. That was the other card that we hadn't considered here that, that is going to throw a wrench in the works of Steve's Ishkanah. This land. is huge for Matt Severa because Ishkanah does nothing the turn it comes into play now. Steve was forced to cash in the Harness Lightning on Toolcraft Exemplar. He could not save his removal spell for Thalia. Yeah, not without giving up. And what does he have now? His he has, conduit. He, he, he has drew a, a non-basic land for the turn, and that wow. does it. Matt Severa is your champion here in Denver. And you can smile now, Matt. He looks more relieved than joyous here, I have to say. What a hard-fought battle for Matt Severa, defeating the always tough Steve Rubin and becoming our champion here in Denver with Mardu Vehicles. Congratulations, Matt. That will do it for the finals here from Denver. Hey there, welcome back to the booth here in Denver. Great stuff. This is a, just a tense top eight. Yeah, man, what a tournament, what a match, what a champion. Yeah, Congratulations, really, Matt Severa. It was great stuff. I, I can't imagine how tired Steve Rubin is right now. Remember, he's the one that played that marathon game three yeah. just to make it through to the semis. He still had to win another match there and, uh, and get all the way here. But uh, great stuff from both of our players. And it ends up Mardu Vehicles at the top of the heap here. Um, you know, it wasn't one of the most popular decks. I mean, it was well represented. It wasn't zero or two or something like that, but that wasn't one of the top three decks that we saw come into day two. Mm -hmm. And Matt Severa, um, he knew Marvel, if Aetherworks Marvel was gonna be a popular archetype, he came prepared with four ceremonious rejections in his sideboard, but it was a different innovative card that ended up winning him that finals match, Thalia Heretic Cathar. So good. So good, yeah. Both games one and three, I think it was the deciding card. Absolutely, and you know, the, the interaction that we saw the most that was fantastic was against Ishkana, right? Because how many times have we seen this where an aggressive deck gets off to a decent start and they think they're just rolling right along, they've got them down to five or six, and then their opponent goes, Ishkana, go, and they're just like, this is going to take forever. Mm -hmm. I don't, you know, burn spells aren't really popular right now as, as far as ones that actually go to the head. You know, sometimes you'll see these aggressive decks and they'll have, you know, lightning bolt you out type scenario. That, that doesn't happen in standard these days very often. Yeah, if, when you have four creatures that can block both flying and non-flying, you're safe in standard. And uh, there are very, very few cards that these aggro decks can turn to to beat Ishkana. Um, but Thalia is one of them, and Matt Severa took three copies of Thalia in place of other great popular options in his three-drop slot. He rode it all the way to victory today. Yeah, the other card that we've been talking about out of this Mardu Vehicles deck that he's maximized on, Reed, that, you know, it seemed to do great work for him is Unlicensed Disintegration. Over the course of the weekend, man, we, we saw him take out some really key blockers or even key threats with it, and, of course, pile on that extra damage, which got him ever closer. Yeah, that card is just awesome. It's It's you know, borderline unfair. People play murder and to take an already good standard card and just tack on three damage to the opponent, make it arguably easier to cast yeah. with only single colors of mana. Very, very good card. Yeah, that's the kind of thing that uh, Matt Severa was looking for and uh, it paid off for him. In fact, I can tell you he's ready with Gabby Sparks for a post-match interview right now. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the sideline. I'm here with Matt Severa, fresh off his Grand Prix win. Matt, congratulations. Nice. That is awesome. I actually got to interview you earlier at the beginning of the tournament before you had played at all, and your thoughts were kind of like medium on yeah. the deck. How are you feeling now? Uh, good. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I feel great. So what were you thinking the last couple of turns of the tournament? Uh, mostly that I hope he doesn't play Ishkana and make spiders, <laughs> because otherwise I was done for. Was there any so. point at the game that you knew you were definitely going to win? Um, when I when he passed the turn and I drew Thalia, yeah. um, I figured I was a heavy favorite, because he would need an answer to Thalia and another land and an Ishkana. Yeah. 
So I don't know if you talked about about it afterwards, but he did have an Ishkana. So but, I mean, it I was, it was Ishkana. yeah, 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 yeah. Right. All right. So that was looming. That is awesome, though. So how do you feel about the deck now? You know, you're splashing blue for Ceremonious Ejection. Mm -hmm. I'm sure a lot of people are probably curious. Would you do that again? Do you like the mana base? So I would definitely do it again, mm -hmm. although it never ca came up. I never cast Ceremonious Rejection. Really? But I, yeah, I mean, it just yeah. that's how it worked out. But um, I think for the meta, like, it was it was really great. There's yeah. just a ton of Marvel here. Um, and there's also, like, uh, Seth Manfield's deck, which plays a bunch of Eldrazi. Yeah, so, yeah. I mean, yeah, it came in there, too. Any other changes that you might do to the deck moving forward? Uh, I thought the Fragmentize on my board was a little bit weak. Okay. But other than that, I... I, you know, pretty happy. Very cool. And this is your second Grand Prix. This is your third Grand Prix win. Uh, Two yeah. others were Let's with teams, teams, and this is your first individual one. Congratulations. Yep. Any last person you want to thank? Any shout outs? Uh, yeah. So uh, Power9.com, which yep. sponsors me, and um, then my testing team, which is uh, CFB and company. Yeah, and they're all here, and they're all very excited for you. So congratulations, Matt, again. We will see you at Pro Tour Ether Revolt. Great. All right, thank you so much, Gabby. Great stuff from Matt Severa down there, and obviously a worthy champion. Great stuff from him. Reed, before we sign off, I want to ask you, how's your, uh, how's your week? How was your weekend in the booth? I had an awesome time. We, we got lucky, man. We saw some sweet yeah. matches, didn't we? Uh, you know, I'll be honest with you. Some part of me going into this tournament was dreading, like, are we just going to see blue, white against black, green, round after round? Like. Um, standard had seemed to, to stagnate into that pattern mm -hmm. for the last couple of weeks. Not the case at all, not even close. People brought innovative decks. We had a diverse top eight. We had um, two unusual decks in the finals. Just great matches, great decks all around. Yeah. Calder Standard seems awesome right yeah, now. Yeah, I think so too. And it's a surprise, I, I have to say, for a late format like this and we've had these cards for a while now things tend to really settle down at this stage but all of a sudden there was panharmonicons with cloud blazers just flying all around somebody had metallurgic summonings you know we had that blue red deck make it in that was like you know getting back uh, prized amalgams and stuff like that people are definitely still innovating even on the more micro level when you look at the popular decks hey look red green ether etherworks is a great deck but people next leveled it and put blue in to, to help fight the mirror that kind of stuff yeah there's a lot of customization Pos um, possible both in mm -hmm. your archetype, in brewing, and in your individual card choices within these archetypes. Yeah, good stuff. And a fun weekend for all. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us here from Denver. Uh, we had a great time bringing you the tournament. This is, of course, time for us to sign off. Uh, I want to thank everybody here at Cascade Games who helped put on the tournament, all the judges and staff that make these things possible, and, of course, you for joining us. We really do appreciate you taking your time and spending the weekend with us. We'd be so lonely without you. So for Luis Scott Vargas, for Gabby Sparks, for Reed Duke, I'm Marshall Sutcliffe. We'll see you at the next one.